Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, here with part two of the Q&A episode. And frankly, I'm not even going to fuck with an introduction this time because there are so many questions and I want to get to as many as possible. So we are just going to jump right in. All right, so I had a couple of questions that were from back in August, actually, basically the last time I'd after I'd closed the last Q&A, um, but they were both kind of about visiting Greece. So I thought, what a good way to start out this episode. Um, so Penelope asked, what's your dream mythology inspired itinerary for Greece? Any sites in the mainland that you haven't visited, but feel are must see. So Penelope, one great name. Um, I actually have a number of friends who have named their children Penelope. Plus, you know, we got the Odyssey. There's just so much happening there. Well done. Dream itinerary. So I thought this was a good time to kind of bring up, um, you know, it, it is already closed for this year, but we, I am doing the first ever like official myths baby group trip to Greece, which is just so utterly wild. Um, but if it goes smoothly, I hope to do this more often. And we set up a really incredible itinerary that honestly, I think serves as a really great, like, if you want to squish in as many ancient sites as possible, um, you know, in and around close enough to Athens that it's doable, this is a great itinerary. So I thought I'd share it with you all in case you just want to like do it on your own. So basically every flight, you know, unless you're coming from within Europe or even better within Greece, everything is going to just land in Athens. That's where you land. Obviously, also you want to see Athens because the ruins in Athens are amazing. You know, we've got there's so much Greek ruins to see, but there's also a lot from the Roman period, which is really interesting as well. You get to see some architectural differences, like really learn to spot those things. It's incredibly fun. So, you know, if you are in Athens, actually, I'm going to leave the if you're in Athens to the next question. So we'll go with beyond Athens, because if you're looking at sites generally, okay, so you arrive in Athens, great, see everything there, I will get into it. Then you can go to Eleusis, or as it's called now, Eleusis. Uh, which is only like 45 minutes to an hour, I think, outside of Athens. It's like on the way to most other things that I'm going to talk about. So it's a great kind of stopping point. Eleusis is fascinating because the ancient site itself, while enormous, is like not well publicized. There's not a lot like happening there as far as I could tell. I went not this year, but last year. It was, it's really interesting and it's really big, but it's sort of just like there, just being Eleusis, which was, of course, like an enormously important ancient site. It was the site of the Eleusinian Mysteries. It it was huge. And so what you can see now is like, it's really hard to get kind of a grasp on what was there because it's sort of still kind of, it's kind of seems very in progress. The museum at the time was closed. That happens with a lot of regional Greek museums. But definitely a must visit. And it's really easy because you can basically drive, like if you rent a car, do drive Athens, to Eleusis. You go see everything there. Like I said, modern Eleusis. And then you keep driving. You go over, you go like through the mountains there. And there's a couple tunnels that are named um, for people that Theseus killed on the way to Athens, which is so fun. And then you curve down and you go across the Isthmus of Corinth, which is incredible. Like the, the canal in Corinth is amazing. Take a look at that. And then you can go visit Corinth, which I have not been had the time to visit Corinth, unfortunately, but I know there are a little bit of a couple of ancient sites there. Uh, but if you go further south, then you can get to Epidavros, um, which is where there is the modern theater that is the best preserved uh, theater in Greece. It's not sorry. It's an ancient theater, but it is the best preserved and it is still in use today. If you go in July and August, they put on Greek plays. I have never seen them because I have not been able to brave that heat. Uh, but one of these days <laughs> I will. But they performed at Epidavro. So not only is that theater incredible, but right near the theater, like just like in the same general site, is the Asclepion, which is this enormous temple complex to Asclepius. Um, if you've played Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it's where you go and like ask all those questions when you're searching for your mom. Um, but yeah, like there's this whole Asclepion. The ruins are pretty incredible. And it's just sort of like there hanging out. And then also close to that, like within half an hour to an hour drive is Mycenae. You can visit the ancient site of Mycenae, which is utterly incredible. It's Bronze Age. It's fucking huge. The, the, the Tholos tombs there, the beehive tombs, utterly incredible. Incredible. There's also a site at Tiryns, um, 
which I have not been to, but I know they also have Tholos tombs. Tiryns was also a major archaeological or is a major archaeological site, but also like a major mythological site. Um, and then just south of there is Nafplio. It doesn't have much in the way of of my kind of ancient love, but the museum there is really interesting. They have a lot of stuff, um, but it is mostly, I think, a, a Byzantine slash Ottoman kind of region. There's a lot of history around the Greek War of Independence, which is cool. Um, but in terms of ancient stuff, not quite as much, but it's a great place to stay and there's lots of great food. So you can kind of do the whole Argolid and Attica and Athens like pretty easily if you have more time you can drive and you can go to sparta i don't think there's a ton of of ruins left to see in sparta but it's still sparta sparty now uh and olympia i would love to see olympia i haven't gotten as far as that yet but also an enormous ancient site to be visited now of course also you can do a day trip from athens and go to delphi if you wanted that's about two and a half hour drive i think it's in a different direction so it's trickier these are all the things we're doing on this trip which is pretty amazing so i'm hoping we can do it again we are not going as far as olympia and sparta unfortunately but we are doing that whole argolid bit um and also Delphi, um, because Delphi, yeah, like it's a, another drivable site. Obviously, Delphi is fucking incredible to see. It's absolutely unreal. Um, another great little drive you can do from Athens is to go to the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion. Utterly stunning. Like it's a beautiful temple generally, but it's also on a cliff overlooking the sea. It's fucking beautiful. Um, and if you go there, you can also go down into Lavrio, which is one of the port towns and the seafood there. Oh my God, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, so like those are some really simple things you can do, you know, if you are just generally in that area without having to go too far. So that is my kind of, that was my dream itinerary just in terms of what is like doable. Um, so again, hope to make this like a regular thing, but it's a really good little itinerary if you are going on your own too. Now, if you want to expand, like there's just so much, like ideal you would go to Delos it's fucking amazing but you have to take a ferry it's like three hour ferry minimum um so it's, it is trickier but if you're there for a longer time you know Naxos is amazing Delos highly recommend and of course there is literally so much more it's endless but I will stick with that for now and we'll move on straight to Evan's question who said I'm planning a trip for for a trip to Athens in March and apart from the usual sites and museums is there anywhere you'd recommend that we should definitely go whether that be cafes or unique places. So Athens, I'm going to go off the top of my head. I'm sure I could think up more, um, but we'll go with some simple stuff again. Like if you're in the area, one, do go to the National Archaeological Museum. It is like further, if you're just kind of staying around the Acropolis, like that's lovely and beautiful. The Acropolis Museum is absolutely a must see as well. The Archaeological Museum is a little further. It's not far, but it's like not easily walkable basically. But go see it. Go Take a whole day for that museum. It is unbelievable, the stuff they have in there. It is unreal. It is one of my favorite museums in the world. Super underrated because Greek museums don't tend to have a lot of money. So they're they're a little like bare bones. Um, you know, that's less true in Athens. But, it, but like the stuff that's in there. <sighs> so go to the National Archaeological Museum. No question. Again, Acropolis Museum for sure. Um, the ancient sites, they have this like uh, bulk ticket. That's the wrong word. But they have this ticket that you can buy that's like 10 euro more than just the Acropolis price. And it gets you into five different ancient sites. See all of those. One of the sites that not everybody goes to, it's like, but you can walk it, um, is Karamaikos. Karamaikos is amazing. It's an ancient cemetery. Go to Karamaikos. If you go in September or October, often you will see tortoises fucking. It's pretty fun. But also there's a lot of great ruins and cats. It's a whole deal. Absolutely go to Karamaikos. Um, oh, everything. Gosh. I mean, there's just there's just so much. There is an incredible restaurant in the Placa. So again, really touristy area, but really good restaurant called Tocafeneo. It does just mean the cafe. But the Tocafeneo in the Placa. Oh, my God. The food. Unbelievable. Um. Yeah. Oh, and there's a great cocktail bar that I love called Hitch Cocktails. It's like really tucked away. It's by the Acropolis Museum. Again, really in the touristy area, but I absolutely love it. Um, That's my go-tos uh, for Athens. And, you know, see everything, but do not miss, miss the National Archaeological Museum and give yourself enough time. It's huge. The stuff. Oh, my God. I could dream of that museum literally forever. Thank you, Evan. Oh, my God. Have so much fun. Okay, next up from Stephanie. As for how the ancient people saw their gods, did they see them as the concept of their powers, i.e. Zeus and lightning, every time lightning strikes, Zeus was the lightning, or controlling said lightning, 
Or did they see them as physical humans, like able to interact with the common people? What makes me think that way was the amount of children the gods had with the mortals or both or other. Great question. I think the answer is all of the above. Honestly, all of the above. And I think that's what makes it so great, right? So Greek mythology, it's just like, it's so many different things. If you are looking at the most ancient of sources, it is a lot more of the gods representing these like physical concepts, you know, uh, of both being the weather, natural phenomena, and also being these deities who can be interacting with humans. Again, now that is, that's much more of like that historical mythological take. Like, I don't think people living in Athens, you know, even as far back as the archaic period, were going thinking that like they're going to run into a god at any time. I don't think that that was a mindset, but I do think that they had this kind of conceptual idea that there, you know, was this time when the gods interacted with humans. That's how all the babies came about. You know, like I think they had this kind of conceptual idea of it being a thing, a past thing, but I don't think it was like a thing they actually worried about. Um, but yeah, light, lightning is trickier. Lightning, like he controls them because it's like the Cyclops made the lightning bolts kind of thing. You know, Poseidon is the earth shaker. But he is not the sea. He does control certain things. Like it's very conceptual. It also really does change over the time period. So like we are talking about a thousand years worth of mythology, right? And a thousand years worth of people evolving. Think about how much the world has evolved in the last thousand years. Thousand years. And it's often, it's easy to forget that because we just think of Greek history and Greek mythology as this like thing, this like singular thing, particularly mythology. But the mythology too was evolving over a thousand years. That's why when I tell you guys stories, sometimes it's like, well, this version said this and this said that and this said that. And it's like, it doesn't make any sense. And that's simply because like, we are talking a thousand years. If I am, the difference between reading Hesiod, okay, Hesiod, which is, you know, the earliest surviving source we have for sort of the beginning of the world, all of the gods and their origin story. That's the earliest surviving. We think it was probably put to paper in the 5th or 6th century BCE, but it is probably older than that. Or then you jump right to, say, Pseudo Apollodorus, who is another great source for just like kind of everything in myth. It was really brief, but it kind of covers all of the basics. Now, Pseudopolidorus is difficult. We call him Pseudo because there was a time when we believed that he was, this was written by somebody named Apollodorus, who I think then they thought he was like second century BCE. And then it became clear that like, no, whoever wrote this, it was probably later. It wasn't Apollodorus, but that's the name. That's why we call it Pseudo Apollodorus instead. And that was probably more like first century CE, I think. So we're talking like 700 years between him and Hesiod, right? 700 years. So you sort of think about that in terms of any kind of understanding. Like, sure, when Hesiod was around, they probably did have a deeper understanding of the gods as like this like physical construct in the world. Whereas 700 years later, they're probably thinking a bit more spiritually. They're thinking a bit more in terms of how we see religion now as, as more of like a little bit less like hands on, right? And so you just kind of have to imagine, you know, how much can change in that amount of time. It's utterly fascinating. So, yeah, it's a great question. I also think truly all of your ideas are right in different ways, you know. OK, Stephanie had a few. We're doing one more from Stephanie, but thank you for all of them. So as a member of the LGBTQ community, Sappho plays a huge role in how I identify. Love her. Or as you would say it, I love this shit. I even have a tattoo piece of her. Me too. But are there any other surviving fragments or pieces by ancient Greek women poets who wrote about women that we know of. Okay, there are other Greek women poets. I don't know offhand if any of them wrote about women. Um, I would say, I mean, Sappho is certainly the best surviving. The thing about Sappho is she survives a lot because of random luck. Um, a lot of the reason why Sappho's fragments are so fragmentary is because they were like literally found on like little bits of ripped up papyrus that was like reused on other things. It's really interesting. But that's all to say that like most of Sappho was not um, preserved intentionally, which is why we don't have a lot from other poets as well. So we know there were other female poets and there are other fragments I think that survive. They're just minimal compared to Sappho. I don't remember their names offhand, um, but... But there's a book called Sappho's Liar by Diane Rayer, and it is about Sappho, but it also talks about other women poets um, at the time and sort of what we do have that survives or what we do know about the people that existed. So I highly recommend that if you want to learn more. Um, there are definitely a handful. 
Sappho is still the best example. And again, I don't know if those women wrote about other women. Even Sappho, the problem is like people will love to argue that like, oh, when she wrote about women, it's because she wrote the poem for a man to give to a woman. It's like, okay, like give me a break. The like straight washing of that is pretty wild. But what that just means is that like it is hard for us to have like any kind of real grasp on what was happening because it has just been straight washed for so long. Do I believe Sappho was gay? Absolutely. Like, I think that, you know, she was, I mean, it's tough to say, like, she did write about men too. I think she was probably bi, you know, but absolutely she did write about women. That's all to say that was like a not a super helpful answer, but read that book (laughs) if you want to know more. The subtitle of it is literally Archaic Love and Women Poets of Ancient Greece. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. My glasses are on, but the book is far enough away that I had to make sure. All right, Lauren says, do you ever plan on talking about Troilus and Polyxena and all the other horrific things Achilles did throughout his life? I had somebody on to talk about the Shakespeare play about Troilus and Cressida. That's not helpful. Um, I don't know enough about Troilus. I feel like all of that is from the fall of Troy source, probably. I want to ask you, but I can't. Um, but yeah, I think all of that survives, as far as I know offhand, survives in only the Roman source, the fall of Troy. Um, so I just never tend to go to that, but I do want to eventually. It's just like an enormous fucking epic that is kind of hard to get through. Um, but yeah, no, I would love to. I do want to talk more about the Trojan War characters generally, but it is so hard because 99% of what we have from Greece is from the Iliad. And like, I've done that. The Iliad obviously loses out on a lot of things. I think Polyxena would have been in the Trojan women, maybe. I'm free. There's so many women with similar names. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's a good example. I wish I knew more of them offhand, but I'm going to put them on my list of people to look into about whether I can do a whole episode on them. So thank you, Lauren. All right, next, one of my Emilies. Um, That's just a running joke. If you get it, you get it. Emily says, sorry if this seems like rambling, but recently I was thinking about Greek myth and how it is a good, in quotes, thing for a woman to be thin ankled and how that would be basically the only way her appearance would be described, if at all. Also, I have heard Hera being referred to as cow faced, and I wondered if that would be a good thing or a slight dig at her. I guess what I am trying to ask is there an expert slash source you could point me to that talks about the subject of beauty slash appearance in ancient Greece and their possible nuances? Oh, what a great question. I'm racking my brain. I want to have the answer to this. The neat ankled thing. So sometimes it's translated as thin ankled and sometimes it's translated as neat. I like neat better. It is still weird to focus on ankles, especially because like Greek women... Like, they weren't not showing skin. Ankles is so specific. There's got to be a good reason. And the cow face thing, ah, that's definitely, I'm pretty sure it is meant to be kind. I read about this somewhere and I've forgotten where. This is the problem. I do too much research and then I lose it. I did a little bit of digging, but I literally just Googled, so I won't pretend like I have better sources to give you. But I think that it's more... It was so it's like sometimes cow face, sometimes cow eyed, sometimes ox eyed. These are just like translational differences. Um, But I think it seems like it's more about just her having like big, pretty eyes like, you know, because also you have to think like it's we think of cow as a bad insult because of fat phobia and like the grossness of the last, you know. 100 years or so or like as a millennial I think of the grossness of just the 90s and the 2000s but like cows and heifers and ox like those were really important animals and like it wasn't an insult it's just like oh you have big eyes you know um these are just like vitally vitally important animals so I think it is like a nice thing but it just sounds weird to us um as for the wider question which was so great of like where to look for stuff like this. I don't have an answer, but I desperately want one. Um, So I might be, I might try to look into this a little further and maybe hopefully mention something on an upcoming episode. 
because it sounds so interesting and I imagine that there's a great source on this because I think it is probably like a, a really full topic with like so much to learn um because the epithets were so weird like some epithets are wild and they make very little sense you know it's contextual it's like what mattered and what was important back then but the neat ankled thing has always made me laugh like what anyway i would love to know more i hope to have an answer in the future i'm sorry for not having it now but um yeah i'm only doing i'm doing literally what i can to survive right now so th- thank you for asking it though my god <laughs> okay so i have a question from srishti and chloe i hope i pronounced that even remotely right um who both collectively said, could you please do a small episode on the birth of some minor goddess, god slash goddesses, Hestia, Hecate, children of Nyx, etc. And I'm reading that because it's a, I would love to if there was anything. But it, when it comes to the minor gods, the sources tend to be, they were born. Like that's it. So it would be like, these are the children of Nyx and then list names. Hestia is the daughter of X. I'm not even gonna say who because there's all these different options. But it's like that's it. There's no story. Um, and the pro- I would I wish I could talk more easily about kind of everyone. But the thing is, is that if I come into a microphone and I just list people who people were born of, like people are not going to sit through a half an hour of that. And I have to make them half an hour just by giving you guys ads. I really try not to give you ads on anything less. Um, so yeah. I just there isn't unfortunately like there just isn't enough um but I did read the theogony last year or the year before around this time of year which is a good example of that like it's literally just a list of who was born to whom yeah I w- I honestly like I so wish there was more and that's why I kind of recommend it to you guys to ask me about these gods because if there are gods that you'd like to know more about you know I'd love to talk about them in this kind of setting when I can when it comes to the births though which is, yeah, what you asked about here. Like, there's just, there's nothing. There's literally just who were their parents if we know them. And that's, that tends to be about it. I'm always looking for more on Hestia and Hecate. Um, I think when this episode comes out, it'll be right after my episode with Natalie Haynes, uh, where we just basically talked about Hestia. Revolving around her newest book, but mostly we just talked about Hestia. And even she was like, there's nothing. And I'm like, I know, it's awful. I just want to talk about Hestia all the time, but there's nothing. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I think, yeah, (laughs) I'm sorry. You can tell that I want to tell you more. There's just not enough. If I ever find a way to, to fit in an episode that isn't going to be just a boredom factory and talk about all these gods, I will. I promise. All right, this one comes from Ariadne. (laughs) Thank you, Ariadne. Hi, I love the podcast and have been obsessed with Greek mythology for a long time. I am also of Greek descent, hence my name, I guessed. But notice that though you have covered covered extremely well uh, some of my favorite ancient Greek heroines, Clytemnestra, Thetis, Electra, Circe, you have yet to do an episode on my namesake, Ariadne, but I have. Um, I've done tons of material on her if you're interested, though I'm sure you have that covered and would absolutely love to hear her often ignored story. So my question is, could you do an episode slash share what you know about her? So Ariadne, one, if you want to send me mention of whatever sources you have, I'm always happy to hear of sources i do only really look to primary sources um with some exceptions but i would absolutely love to hear what you have to share with me so please feel free to email me um it's mythsbaby at gmail.com but i have done an episode on ariadne the problem with ariadne's story is that aside from the dionysiaca which i have not been able to dive deep enough into yet um her story just revolves around, unfortunately, Theseus and Dionysus. She does deserve better, but those are the facts. And so I have done an episode on her. Um, if you just search Ariadne in a podcast app and then look for my podcast, you will find it. Um, I think there's only been a couple. But yeah, I've definitely talked about her in relation to those men because she's awesome and she deserves the world. 
But unfortunately, I have to work with what sources exist. But also, it's really great that that's your name. I, I love that for you. Thank you. And speaking of names, literally the very next day, I had a question from, and I'm going to pronounce your name like we do in North America. And I apologize if that's not how it's pronounced, but Eunice. Um, but I'm also going to later try to guess how it would be pronounced in Greek because Eunice says, my name is derived from the Greek goddess Nike, which of course you already know. You know what? I didn't. We'll get into that. Is there any slash enough research to touch on her mythos? I hated my name for most of my adolescence until I learned its etymology, which also kicked my interest, kicked off my interest in mythology. Thank you for the show. Thank you. I love that. Um, So I didn't like I know that Nikki is based off Nike because in Greece they basically pronounce it Nikki. But I love that. And so I Googled it um, and it looks like it's specifically good victory. It's just where the the EU at the beginning comes in, which I love. I imagine in modern Greek, if it is still a modern Greek name, it would be pronounced like Evniki, which I love. Evniki. That would be so that's so pretty. Um, anyway, I love that so much. So <sighs> Nike, uh, she is tricky. I love her. I mean, the winged victory of Samothraki is my has my whole heart, obviously, because I've been there and it's the greatest place in the world. But Nike is a one of those frustrating deities, honestly, like like the ones I mentioned earlier, because I think she she a daughter of Nyx or somebody else. Either way, um, she is one of those personification deities where, like I talked about last week in the Q and A, like you know, Kronos with an H, how he just is time. Nike is just is victory, right? And so. There is no story about her as a character because she didn't matter as a character. And I mean that in a good way, because basically Nike was there for any and all victorious moments, any and all victories that happen in any myth. If the word victory appears, then it was Nike, right? Particularly if you read a translation, it's capitalized. You can just be like, that might as well be Nike. So, you know, it, there are no stories about her. We do know. I just I just made sure um, she is the daughter of Styx. Apologies, not Nyx. Styx. Um, but we do. So uh, that's just it. Right. So we literally have like she is the daughter of the river Styx, but she just is victory like her siblings are power and force and zeal. So it's like they are just conceptual, you know? It's it's unfortunate because we want to hear these things, especially because she's beautiful and all these, the visual representations of her, right? Like she's this lovely goddess with these gorgeous wings, especially like if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say winged victory, um, Google it. Uh, there's a lot of different names. Um, she's in the Louvre. Uh, I think where they call her Winged Victory. She's Nike of Samothraki, Samothrace. Uh, but she was stolen, you know, um, by the French, which is why she's there. Um, but it's nice to call her, you know, by her more Greek name. It, it the same applies if you just FYI, if you want to adjust how you say these words. Um, but the Venus de Milo, right, was also stolen by the French. She is Aphrodite of Milos. There is no reason to call her Venus because she was a Greek statue found in Greece, stolen from Milos. Um, and so the name Venus de Milo sounds, it's just like very not, you know, where she came from. So that is Aphrodite of Milos, more accurately speaking. Uh, anyway, but Nike is just so interesting because we we want her to have these stories. We want her to have so much more. But it is just purely that she was just victory. So, you know, even if you go on her, you know, her list of all the mentions of her in the ancient sources on Theoi, as I'll mention Theoi again, we literally just have, you know, um, sticks, <laughs> bare. Oh, look, trim ankled Nike in Hesiod. So we with that that's what we have. She she had her nice ankles. You know. Um oh she's called warlike in the Homeric hymn. That's nice. Um 
she's yeah she mentioned later the daughter of Styx like she she was often shown accompanying Athena just because of these associations with war and strategy and victory she you know is mentioned in relation to the war with the Titans but again because somebody won you know it it's not about including someone in the story so much as making sure that your story includes victory. Um, I do see there's some references in the Dionysiaca, which I've mentioned. Uh, but again, I think it's just going to be related to just the concept of victory. It's unfortunate. I don't, you know, I know I've checked this before because I've been looking for more on Nikkei forever, forever. I promise I would have told you, but it's just these these conceptual ideas of victory broadly because she just, it's not that she wasn't important. It's that she was too important as a concept for them to bother writing her into stories or theorizing on stories because it's like, well, they didn't need to because if she's in every story because she's victory, right? They just had different priorities than us. Um, It was just about writing down the, this uh, a story of a major event and so like no of course Nikki was there but just because there was victory so I hope that helps I really always want to have more satisfying answers for you guys personally I find that part more interesting like I think it's more interesting to look at why there are no stories of her and how that is because she was this concept um but I know that it's frustrating to most um but either way your name is beautiful and uh yeah So, and Nikkei is seriously cool, even if we don't have stories of her. (laughs) All right. Next one, I have one from Allie who says, I've been listening to and loving the podcast for years, but this is the first time I'm writing in for a QA and a episode. I'm usually listening while I'm in between appointments or steaming dresses at my job as a bridal stylist. Since I'm around brides all day and listening to plans about their wedding while we find them the dress, I wanted to ask what you think the worst wedding in all of Greek myth is. I go back and forth between Perseus and Andromeda's and Peleus and Thetis's. Are there other major weddings of note? Can we even count Iphigenia's wedding to Achilles? On a completely separate note, I also wanted to ask if you're watching the new animated show Crapopolis. I'm really liking it so far. You are not the first person to ask about Crepopolis, so I will just very quickly tell you and the other, I'm sorry, no, I have not watched it. Um, But to your earlier question, oh my God, worst wedding. I think you're right in debating between those two, but I also think you're right in popping in Iphigenia's fake wedding to Achilles. Like I think arguably, probably that one's the worst if you want to count it as a wedding because like... If you're this nice teenage girl being told you're going to marry the best of the Greeks and instead your dad kills you, like, not ideal. Not great. Um, But otherwise, like, I would say probably between Perseus and Andromeda and Peleus and Thetis, I think Perseus and Andromeda has a higher death toll, a much, much higher death. Well, hmm, that's a it has a much higher direct death toll and that like everyone at the wedding dies mostly. But if you count the Trojan War as a death toll of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, well, then that one's worse. Really, I think we could go back and forth forever. And I love that you had me do that. But yeah, I don't think we can pick between them. It's just like, what are the levels of bad? You know, um, there's there's other weddings. Cadmus and Harmonia have a wedding mythologically where shit does not go down. So that's nice for them. Um. Yeah, I think that's the only like kind of more official wedding. Uh, There's some really interesting stuff about um, young women preparing for their wedding. Um, We talked about it in my episode with Dr. Ellie Mack and Roberts about Persephone because they often looked to that story um, in preparation for their own wedding, both by being excited and also from the other side of, oh, my God, I'm being forced to marry this man. And I think that 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 story really connected with a lot of people so that was really interesting conversation i had if you wanted to listen to it but i definitely think you're right in terms of your theorizing on the worst weddings for sure okay we're gonna try to power through a bunch more because you guys have so many good questions and also time is a thing okay vicky wrote in and they say hey live big fan here my question is what myth can people read if they like the weirdest stuff ever including me tbh i'm with you vicky okay homer came to hermes Chef's fucking kiss. It's literally perfect. Oh, what else? I mean, the Alcestis play is weird as shit, um, but it is a play. The myth is a little bit more 
mysterious and missing. I mean, it's so hard. Like, everything is so weird in its own kind of way, you know? Like, honestly, just reading any of the original sources, like, you're going to get some weird shit. Pick up some Pseudo Apollodorus, even Hesiod, maybe. Homeric hymns, broadly, are pretty fun. Some are weird. Uh, I mean, they were all weird, you know? Like, the story of Pasiphae and the bull is what really reminded me how weird and interesting the Greeks were and like why I was like I think I'm gonna talk about them into a microphone you know and then here we are oh they were all just so weird I wish yeah (laughs) I wish I had more detailed answers Homeric Hymn to Hermes is my good go-to it's a quick read it's deeply wild it's just so silly all right Connor has an interesting question I don't have an answer but Connor I'm going to read it in case other people do Okay, Connor says, as a big fan of the Six musical, I cannot help but notice the similarities between Medea and Catherine of Aragon. Both are foreign princesses married to a king to bear his children, but are cast out for a local wife. Catherine does end up in a nunnery and she isn't happy about it, though she does not kill her daughter on a dragon chariot. Has anyone else written about the similarities between these two, fiction or nonfiction? I don't know. I don't know of anything about Catherine of Aragon, really, but that's really interesting. So, I mean... If anyone has any recommendations for that, feel free to write in and I will read it on an upcoming episode because that's interesting. All right. One from Paris. And they said, love the podcast. I was listening to another podcast, which doesn't have a mythology focus. And so the hosts are not well versed. However, on a tangent, they called the myth of Asterion a parable for stepchildren. I can't recall if you made the same connection, but it seemed misguided to me to refer to the myth as such. What are your thoughts? Is Asterion a a warning about stepchildren or is that too reductionist? Keep up the amazing work. I love listening. Thank you, Paris. Um, I think that is also reductionist. Like, I don't, I mean, if you want to say it, like, I don't think it's wrong, but I think to suggest that that is like any kind of major point of the story of Asterion slash the Minotaur, to be clear, um, is, yeah, is reductionist. I mean, it, it is at its heart something about the gods, right? Like, step stepchild is a stretch. <laughs> like, I mean, for lots of reasons, one being it was a bull, but like stepchildren would, the, the implication would be either like from a previous marriage or a further marriage. But like, yeah, I think, I think it's reductionist and also just like boring. Like, I think there is much more interesting things to say about the Minotaur and Asterion and his birth and him as a character. And yeah, because also like, we don't, I mean, Minos, like, in terms of the ancient sources, he doesn't have a huge role to play. Like, we don't really know. It's uh, it's tough. It's tough. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's an- enough going on in the sources to say that. All right. Um, Lily uh, has says, hi, Liv. Thanks for your guidance on my Paphos assignment last Q&A. You're welcome. I forgot about that. That was fun. Uh, My question is, do you have favorite ancient artwork? Oh, another question where it's just like, what is my mood? But you know what? I'm going to go with. So last year I was lucky enough to go to um, Santorini for the first time. I normally wouldn't have wanted to go. It's so expensive compared to the rest of Greece. But my mom like desperately wanted to go. So we made it a thing. And I mean, thankfully, like, I'm very glad I did because the thing about Santorini, if you ignore all of the tourism, like, it is gorgeous, for one, because it's a fucking volcano, but, like, it's so flippin' expensive compared to the rest of the country. Um, But the incredible thing about Santorini that no one really talks about because it's too busy being Santorini is that, you know, it was a volcano, which means that it does have a preserved city, like, in the vein of Pompeii, only 2,000 years older. Okay, more like 1,600, but, like, 1,600 years older than Pompeii, right? It's called Akrotiri. It's in the south of Santorini. You can take a really easy bus to get there. I think the bus cost us like two euro. It was the best. Um, And Akrotiri is a fully, well, you know, preserved in whatever way possible town from the Bronze Age um, was preserved by the volcanic eruption of Thera. And it is wild. It is incredible. Like, you see an ancient town. Like, but And by ancient in this case, like, I mean the Bronze Age. So I mean... I mean, 1600 years before Pompeii, but like a thousand years before, more than a thousand years before the playwrights, before Plato. Like, it's so old. And this leads me to the actual answer to your question, sorry, which is that in Thera, in the town of Thera on Santorini, it's far from Akrotiri, but it's a small island. 
is the Archaeological Museum of Thera. And holy shit. Because I have been to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. As I told you all, you have to go. It's the fucking best. Do not go to Athens and not see it. And there they have some wall paintings from Akrotiri, from this preserved Bronze Age town. And the wall paintings that they have in the Nam are amazing. They're beautiful. They're so colorful. Like the color is preserved, right, by this volcanic eruption in a way that would never be possible without it. They're incredible. But then you go to fucking Thera and there's like a hundred times as many. So the wall paintings preserved from Akrotiri, like all of them, but like, oh, I can't even, I honestly, I can't even name like a specific favorite because it's just all of them. They're un real or if you want that more famous thing i'm obsessed with wing victory the ones i've talked about earlier it's in the louvre uh because it's from samothrace and also it's this hellenistic joy it's fucking incredible um so yeah those would be my favorites but also honestly like i could list a thousand more (laughs) all right this next one's from emma who says would you ever write another book And would you do an episode on the meanings of Greek names? All right, Emma. One, yes. Uh, So I want to publish lots more books. But I'm currently working on a a new novel. We've set aside Cadmus and Harmonia for a little while because I couldn't get to it. But I've written something else and we're working on it. We're working on making that happen. It is something. Um, The meaning of Greek names. I I love that. Maybe I'll like focus a QA and a on it somehow, sometime. Because the thing about that, it's a lot like what I was talking about. I think earlier, but it was maybe last week I'm recording them both at once. Um, When I was talking about how difficult it is to just like list names, you know, as one person, like if I can turn it into a discussion with somebody that's so different. um, But in terms of me doing an episode, like it would just get boring so quickly, unfortunately, you know, like it just would. So maybe I'll just kind of prompt people next Q&A to like if so, even just now, if you guys have any questions about specific Greek names and the meanings, um, feel free to put them into this the same Q&A form, mythsbaby.com slash questions, and I can get to it in the next Q&A in the summer. Um, because I would love to. It's just that I need prompting and I need it can't be just a list. So if you tell me any names you're interested in, I will do the research and figure it out because um, it's a great idea. It's just one of those things that like logistically just like doesn't work very well in the type of podcast that I have to give you. All right. This next one is from Julia and it gives me joy. She's got three questions. One, maybe this is dumb, but given the Greeks obsession with dicks, why do all those ancient sculptures have such tiny genitalia? Great question. I don't know the answer. Um, like, you know, you know, I don't, I don't because like, A lot of the sculptures do. I'm trying to think of time period and like whether maybe those are coming later. A lot of the things we're imagining. Because like if you're curious about the opposite of that, you go ahead and you type the Roman god Priapus into the Google. You go, you go type Priapus. P-R-I-A-P-U-S. You're welcome. Um... But also, you know, they, like, carry dicks around all the time. They put them on everything. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <sighs> you know, I don't have one, so I just don't think about them that much. <laughs> Number two, do you know anything about Demeter's bee maidens and their dance leading people into the underworld? I saw them mentioned somewhere but never dived into it, although it sounded interesting. Okay, now I am obsessed. Julia. Maybe I'll do an episode on Demeter. I would love to talk more about Demeter, but her story is pretty, like, specifically connected to Persephone. Um, Yeah, I don't. I don't offhand. I would love to learn more, though. So thank you for bringing them up. I mean, I know bees were super important. I mean, they are, obvious. Bees. Jesus. They're, like, going to save or kill the world. And by them killing us, I mean we killing them. Oh, I can't speak today. Um, Yeah. Uh, I don't, but I would love to have that as an idea. So thank you. Um, Number three, how do you feel about the fact that the ancient Romans would pronounce your name as 54? I love that. I think it's funny. Sometimes, oh, a good uh, moment of having my name be Liv is that if somebody texts it to me all in caps, like if they're just being, they're yelling my name at me or like being expositional. Um, And if I ask my phone, if I ask Siri to read it to me, she just says 54. She doesn't say my name. She she just says 54. So the assumption is if it's in all caps, it's actually Roman numeral and not my name. And I find a lot of joy in that. 
And I had one um, from Blendine. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm sorry. Technically, I'm French. I'm shitty at it, though. Um, And I'm not going to read it. um, But I just want to say it was about my Ifig and I Among the Torians episodes. Um, And some of the things that I said without saying, which is what I'm doing again now, um, just because I am not in the mental space to take uh, people accusing me of saying things I didn't say, which is what happens whenever anyone talks about what's happening right now. Um, but I just want to tell you that origi- when this message came in at the beginning of December, like I I couldn't have needed it more. So you you saying what you said and 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 praising or or even just recognizing what I said in those episodes meant so much to me. It really, it really helped me at a really difficult time. Um, so thank you very much for your message. You definitely didn't make it weird. It was really great. All right. I've got just a couple more questions we're going to try to get through. So Andy, she says, are you going to watch the Percy Jackson series on Disney plus? Andy, I don't know. I don't know. I don't currently have Disney for reasons. I don't know. I hope everyone's enjoying it, though. For real, I do. But again, like, I don't know the story. I do, in theory, want to watch it. I do. (laughs) I'm sorry, that's the least helpful answer. But I wanted to read the question and answer it because I know a lot of people are probably thinking that right now. (sighs) All right. And Becca said, hi, Liv. Absolutely love your show. This question isn't really related to anything mythological, but I always see you on trips to Greece, which is an absolute dream of mine. I was just wondering what you do to pass all of your time on what I assume is a very, very long flight from the Canadian West Coast. Becca, it is a long flight. Because there is no direct flight. There is no direct flight. Yes, I am fortunate enough. Thankfully, the podcast, honestly, so you all have helped me be fortunate enough um, to be able to go to Greece quite often. And I couldn't be more grateful. But also, yeah, the flight is crazy long. It's usually about 20 to 24 hours of me traveling just to get there um, because I live on the farthest part of North America, basically. Um, But yeah, no, I read mostly and I try to sleep and, you know, how difficult that can be on a plane. So mostly I just read and try not to, I don't even know, curl in on myself. But it's always worth it. It's always worth it because I'm in Greece. Okay, we're going to end today's with a question from Lauren. And Lauren's brain seems to work a lot like mine, which is why I'm going to joyfully read this entire question, which is long, but you guys are all going to deal with it. All right, Lauren says, first of all, I love your show and you for that matter. Not in a weird way, though. I'm not a creep, I promise. However, I do have one gripe. You had the audacity to flaunt your podcaster privilege getting Stephanie McCarter's translation of Metamorphoses early while the rest of us ha- peasants had to endure the agonizing wait as the calendar dragged on and on watching the days when the status went from pre-ordered to shipped. I wish you could hear the dripping sarcasm. It's truly a crime. And I also hope that my assumption is true because if not, I'm an asshole. Anyway, my ADHD brain got all dramatic. My question is this. When it comes to translations of ancient texts, besides being leery of most translations by cishet white dudes and buying slash acquiring the text before reading it, are there things to look for or ways to identify clear biases? Are there translator blacklist websites or a few translators that you can recommend? Recommend. I know Emily Wilson is chef's kiss that maybe aren't as well known to give you a little context. I have a similar narrative when it comes to mythology and that I picked up a Disney-fied copy of Greek myths and I've not only ended up gay, but I'm now interested in every single culture's mythology and folklore that ever existed. So spiraling down a few rabbit holes at 2 a.m. is child's play at this point. Thank you for all your hard work and powering through on your rough days to give us this amazing content. Thank you for being so open about those hard days. Oh, that's as ironic. Thank you. Not ironic. This bad grammar live. Um, about those hard days and still showing up for us, though I hope you're showing up for yourself because you're pretty fucking fabulous. As someone who struggles with a laundry list of mental illnesses, I can relate and I have an idea of how hard it can be to literally just put socks on. I can barely function and bathe when I'm having a particularly bad time, so I can't imagine running a podcast and that podcast being your sole income at this point. I don't know how often you get people thanking and validating you for that, so I just wanted to make sure that I did. Liv, you're a goddamn goddess yourself and thank you for loving this shit. I started reading that because it was just like funny, silly ADHD brain. And then it became deep. Um, Thank you. Really? I, I couldn't have possibly needed that more because sometimes, sometimes I have to podcast even when, even when the, the worst thing has happened. So thank you um, for appreciating it. 
I always love my job, but some, it is very weird having a job where I just talk into a microphone and hope people listen. Sometimes I really do need to actually hear from people who do listen because it can feel really odd that I just do this it, and just kind of like let it go out into the world and hope for the best. Um, so thank you. I, I, I really did start reading this because I just wanted to answer your question about translators and also laugh about basically everything you te- you typed because it was incredibly funny um about stephanie mccarter it's that the book had come out in the uk and i so it you uh, north americans had to wait or maybe it was the opposite maybe it was it had come out in the u.s and british people had to wait i don't remember i'm sorry i definitely did get it early though and that was my podcaster privilege actually that time too i didn't even use i used to work at penguin and sometimes i get stuff early because of them not because of podcaster. But this time, it was all podcaster. Anyway, uh, that's a great translation. But translations broadly, I'm trying to think of anyone who I would know is like, bleh. Um, I mean, I think the newer, the better, generally, not always. But, um, you know, if you pick up one that's really cheap, it's usually cheap because it's like 100 plus years old. And while, you know, there's nothing wrong with those inherently like I'm obviously I read them on the show because they're all I can legally read aloud to you guys but like there's uh, imagine a hundred years ago like there's biases there uh just inherent by the world a hundred years ago whether they be about women or just racist or you know homophobic like who knows right so the newer the better generally but then there are still shitty people out there translating now um again I don't I can't name any offhand that I would be like oh my god no not now um yeah you know there's um so Anne Carson's I really like I've talked about her a lot though so maybe that's not like a behind the scenes one um last week uh on the Q&A I mentioned that Greek myths or, or not Greek myths I might have called it Greek myths it's called Greek plays um it's a it's a modern library edition of like all three tragedians like three or four plays each and it's uh translations from the last like 10 years or so and they're all pretty good um I mean yeah it's it's really difficult there's not like any clear biases that aren't you know like really obvious shit like if you open the book and the word slut is there like that's probably not from the ancient Greek you know probably was just woman um yeah I mean I I I try to just kind of I try to refer to more than one if I can. Sometimes I can't. And, you know, if I know the translator is pretty good. Translation is subjective. You know, like this came up a lot when the new Iliad came out and all the dudes were so angry, like saying that she changed it. And it's like she literally didn't change it. She just made choices because you have to make choices as a translator. It's literally impossible to translate literally because if you are reading a literal translation, it's not going to make any fucking sense because words change and English has, you know, different words for something than Greek would or or multiple words that can mean the same thing in Greek or vice versa. Like, you know, a translation is always going to have bias. Stephanie McCarter talked about this on my episode with her and it was really interesting because it really is always going to have bias because everyone is human and you are going to put your human nature into the translation it is unavoidable the question is what those translators are thinking and intending with that translation so you know when stephanie talked about this she talked about how she was making a conscious effort to equal the playing field between men and women to look at what other translations have done to look at the original latin and make a call you know based on whatever the the least you know, the the sort of, the I guess, the least bias. But again, she she did admit, you know, working within her own bias. Um, it's just, it's really interesting looking at translation and, you know, what has to be done in order for something to not only make sense when translated into a modern language when it was written, you know, 2000 plus years ago, but just like, you know, what comes out of that and what people can read from it. You know, it's, it's utterly fascinating. Like I've read, you know, a bunch of stories from Ovid in like three or four or five even different translations and they're all interesting in their own ways. And, you know, even the old ones that are certainly full of biases, they're still good um, because you're still reading the ancient text in some form. You just have to kind of keep in mind that there might be 
you know, more glaring biases that that you're not aware of, you know, just keep it in mind if you read something and you're like, well, that seems odd, you know, like maybe pick up a different translation and try to find the same passage and how they read it. I just find that really interesting, you know, looking at multiple translations and things like that. Um, Actually, now, the more I ramble, the more I realize. So there is also like there's a website called Poetry in Translation, which provides a lot of free translations um, to to ancient works um i'm not super familiar with the translators involved or all of them at least um but I, it's still like it's a good free resource um that you can go on and read and they are recent translations so while there still might be some biases in there you're not dealing with like a hundred years worth of social innovation being lost you know by reading a really old one um, so, you know, if you, you, if you are looking for a translation, you don't want to spend money or you can't spend money, check out Poetry and Translation if they have what you're looking for or theoi.com or, you know, it, it's always going, there's always going to be something. It is inevitable, even if you're reading it, you know, something translated by, a, like literally anyone, um, is going to have some kind of bias involved. It just sort of depends on what type you want. That's why I look for those written by women or translated by women rather um because i'd rather have that like i'll i'll be blunt about it if i'm gonna have to read something with a bias i want to read it by a woman like sorry i don't really like i'm not going to pretend you know that anyone can can interpret this stuff without a bias obviously i have one too i just happen to think that it's a pretty good one you know just equality weird um yeah so you know but i do think it's a great question and yeah i hope i hope that was helpful Thank you all so much for listening. I I wish I was in a better headspace to answer these questions because um, I feel like I've just not been able to think for the past couple of months, really. Um, but here we are. It had to happen. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's been a time. I Like I said last week, I've been recording a bunch of things up front um, so that I can kind of escape my life for a little while. And I'm really hoping to be in some kind of good shape when I come back and and um return full force to having fun uh with the podcast and being able to write entertaining and smart things and have my brain actually work but it's just been one thing after the other since it's like October and I just need to breathe um but anyway I hope you all enjoyed this anyway. I hope that the, you found the answers helpful. I hope you enjoyed listening to your question be heard. If I didn't get to your question, I'm really sorry. There were really so many. I always think I'm not getting enough. And then I'm like, oh, shit. No, there's too many, even for two hour long episodes. Jesus. Um, but I really I'm so grateful for all of you. Um, I really, really so grateful for everyone who listens to this podcast, for everyone who writes in, for everyone who follows me and comments and emails and literally anything like I it, they all mean the world to me. Um, even if I can't answer or read your que question, like I read it to myself, even if I don't read it aloud, you know, and it all means the whole world to me. Um, I, I really love hearing from people because like I said earlier, like I, this is the greatest job in the world, but there is something particularly weird about recording a podcast and then just putting it out into the world and hoping that people listen. Like it is a, an incredibly odd experience. And sometimes I'm just like faced with this like reminder that so many people listen to me and love the show and all these things, but I otherwise just live in this little bubble. Um, and recently the bubble just kind of like blew up. And so, you know, I really I needed to hear from a lot of you or I didn't know, but I did. Um, and so these these questions were really helpful and, and all the kind words and just the thanks. Hearing anyone say thank you um, for the show means the whole world because I really love what I do. But I do need to know that people, you know, continue to want to hear it and continue to get something out of it because this show is about sharing knowledge in a an exciting and fun and passionate way. Um and it can be, you know, an odd experience. So anyway, I'm I'm just rambling. I really can't think straight. Thank you all so much for listening. 
You're just absolutely wonderful. Um, Let's Talk With Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, my assistant producer. Laura Smith is the production assistant and audio engineer. Select music from this episode is by Luke Chaos. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you get loads of back bonus episodes and more. I'm I'm going to bring back the Q&A as soon, I promise. But until then, at least I have like a good hundred bonus episodes. <laughs> Didn't even realize how many I'd done. Anyway, um, consider joining the Patreon if you want. But either way, thank you for listening. If, thank you. L- listening is enough. You're the best. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.